for dropping by. Um, today I've got something very important to tell you about these things. Now, the matrix test has come to be very, very popular because of the growth in the use of diode lasers. Diode lasers are beginning to get capable of cutting, but they're never going to match CO2 cutting. But the one thing that they're supposedly good at is engraving. And a lot of people try and use them for grayscale engraving. And so they use these material test patterns to try and work out where the colour changes occur so that they can select the appropriate range over which they can do their grayscale photo engraving. For those new people that haven't encountered me before, I'm old, grey, I'm fat, I'm ugly. You can see that for yourself. So God has been pretty kind to me. But I've also been involved with various types of laser for the past eight years. It's a retirement activity that gets me away from the wife's big to-do list. Yeah, mainly it works, but not always. Now, before we go anywhere near the machine and I start demonstrating some of the things that will discredit this piece of wood, we need to go through a few technical facts about lenses and laser beams. Nothing heavy, just a few basic facts that you may or may not have come across when you were doing science at school. Who knows? And they certainly didn't do this sort of thing when I went to school with Nor. Now, I suspect most people recognise roughly what this is. These are lenses and they've got different focal lengths, 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3 and 4. For the diode machines, there tends to be only one or two focal lengths available. I've seen some at around about inch and a half, but most diode lasers are in this two inch region. Now with the CO2 machines, there's a much bigger range of lenses that you can get. And here we've got a four inch lens, which means the focal point is four inches away from the lens. These are what they call the focal points, where the light rays actually focus to almost zero. And the almost zero is defined by something called a spot size. And if we look for the longer focal length lenses, we've got a spot size of about 0.3 of a millimetre, 0.25, 0.18, 0.13. And look, this one here at a 1.5 lens is 0.08. These are circular dots that we produce with the CO2 machine. The spot that you can get for a diode laser is pretty close to this 0.08. Now for a diode machine, this 0.08 is not what it seems. First of all, it's not a spot. It's either a rectangle or it's a an oval. And the oval will be maybe 0 0.08 in its smallest dimension and maybe 0.1 or 0.12 in its largest dimension. Diode lasers are therefore not dissimilar in their ability to focus down to a spot. The way in which a lens works is true for both types of technology. There's no difference between them. Even though the lenses might be made of a different material, maybe a different shape, this is what we're expecting from a lens. It focuses down to a focal point. That means all the rays are passing through a single spot and then the rays diverge. There's nothing wrong with this diagram. It's the way in which light passes through lenses. Laser light has got completely different characteristics to the stuff that you see all around you normal light. Whether it's a CO2 laser or a diode laser, you're going to be faced with the same problem of having to pass the light through a lens to focus it. Now all lenses that are used in the CO2 laser are this shape here. They're what they call spherical. That's part of a sphere. And unfortunately spherical geometry in a lens comes with its own problems. Does that look like a focal point? Obviously the answer is no, because it's a mess. It's approximately a focal point, and I would probably describe it as a fuzzy focus. There's no such thing as an exact focus. That's the way in which the light rays pass through the lens. You would say, but, but that's terrible. We're never gonna be able to do any cutting with a lens like that. Now, it is just possible that with a diode laser, you have a slightly different sort of lens. So there are two types of lenses. There are those which have got spherical geometry, as we've just described, and here enough, look, you'll, and here sure enough, you'll see that the rays that come in from the outside are actually refracted 
more than those rays that are coming in further into the lens. So imagine what's happening just here, near enough at the center. Probably they're going beyond this point here. Well, I know they're going beyond this point here. <laughs> it's possible, and I say possible because I don't know, that in a diode laser, there may be a slightly different sort of lens called an aspheric lens, where the shape of the lens is rather special and all the light is focused down to a single focal point. Sounds like a brilliant idea. Uh, I happen to know that that's not such a brilliant idea because I've been doing a lot of work with lenses and laser beams. The CO2 laser is this yellow material called zinc selenide. Down at 450 nanometers, you can use probably just ordinary glass of some sort, a specialized glass. Now this is a much cheaper lens to manufacture than an aspheric lens. That's why I don't think that they would use an aspheric lens in a diode laser. It will either be something like this, which is something called a plano, because it's plain on one side, convex on the other, or this one, which is convex and concave. And this is called a meniscus lens. But if you take a look, what it does is more or less the same as an aspheric lens. It fixes about 95% of this fuzzy focus. So it's more likely that this is a much cheaper alternative that's fitted to a diode laser. Now, <clears throat> what you're looking at here, it's just a piece of white paint on the corner of my microscope. And you'll see that it is evenly white. I put my finger in the way of the light and I get a shadow. But look, what I've got here is a little light beam. And I'm going to shine that light beam on there. And I hope you can see that that beam is not uniform. It's very bright in the centre and it drops away to almost nothing at the edge. That is what our laser beam is like, whether it be a diode laser or whether it be a CO2 laser. It's a characteristic of the laser beam. It always has a very high intensity energy or light right at the center of the beam, and it drops away in a very predictable manner called a Gaussian distribution, normal distribution to, statist to statisticians, or some people might know it as a bell curve. Let me just show you. Okay, so here we've got an image of the lens, the spherical surface of a lens, and light rays coming in in this direction. And this is the way in which lenses are designed with parallel rays of light hitting on a curved surface. Now, normally all these rays, all this color here would be exactly the same. But to try and help the explanation, what I've done, I've put all these rays in different colors. And what we've got here is a graph of the intensity of the light in the beam. Remember I said the light at the center of the beam was much brighter. In other words, look, we've got a greater intensity as opposed to what there is at the edge of the beam. And that's a predictable characteristic of a laser beam. That's not the way that normal light works. Normal light is a straight line. It's uniformly intense all the way across. Now, with a laser beam, the intensity of the light that hits the surface of the material determines the speed at which it can do damage. Small amount of light will take a long time to do a little damage. A very high intensity light can do a lot of damage very quickly. So here we've got light that damages quickly and here we've got light that's going to do, to be honest, absolutely nothing. We've got this lovely distribution here which is a predictable amount of power. This stuff coming down the center is hardly changing at all. It's staying virtually parallel. It's going in a little bit, but the net result of that is it focuses. Remember what happens to these types of lens? It's going to focus somewhere down here. So the most intense part of the beam where the capable of doing the most damage is going to happen at a point beyond the nominal focal point that we can see here. And that's why I put these colors on here so you can track the colors in and out at the focal point. And although this diagram here shows exactly what's happening to these rays as they pass through a lens, it doesn't tell you anything about the damage potential of what's happening below the focal point. It isn't like this. It's nothing like this. If it was anything like that picture described, I wouldn't be able to do 
what you're just about to see with this piece of 26 millimeter thick hardwood. Look at the shape of that cut there. Does that look as though it's tapered? It's absolutely parallel right the way through 26 millimeters. Here we've got a nice pattern of rays that are in this lovely distribution where we've got maximum intensity at the center with the red and the orange rays. Let's zoom in and see what's happening just down here. A little bit confusing, but you can see the red rays coming in. Here we've got a guess at where I thought the focal points might be. But look, we've got blue rays here coming in from the outside, which are focusing there. We've got green rays, which are coming in from the center, which are focusing there. But the most intense rays, which are these red rays and these orange rays, look, they're still going way, way, way out here to a focal point. So there's basically two problems with a lens. One, it has a physical focal point, which the manufacturer sells you. And two, that's not what you use. You use this I can only call it an intensity focal point. It's the point where the maximum intensity of damage of light is going to occur. And that will not be at the optical focal point. Now, it was my failure to ever get anywhere near the so-called spot size that the lens manufacturer claims that set me off on my long journey into disbelieving what I was being told and exploring for myself what the real properties of lenses and laser beams were. And so consequently, I've got an example here of a, a 38.1, an inch and a half, plano convex lens, fired at a piece of thin card. Now the thin card is there purely because it demonstrates what goes on with the various powers, intensities within the lens. Now, when I have it flat side down, which is the way in which I've demonstrated to you the lens is designed. Here's what happens when we fire the laser beam at it, the focal point. Look, we've got a very, very small central intensity, which has gone right the way through the center and burnt a hole there. But look what the low intensity's done. It's put a scorch mark, a big scorch mark, around the outside of this high intensity hole. The paper is thin, so the high intensity burns its way through the hole very quickly in two milliseconds. That's all it took to do that amount of damage. And then we start increasing to 20, 40 and 60 milliseconds duration holding the beam on. And look, hang on, the beam is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. How can that be if all the light is passing through the focal point? How can the beam get bigger? So. The focal point is not what you believe. And then the other problem is when we turn it from flat side down, which is the way in which the lens manufacturers designed this lens to flat side up. OK, we get a bigger hole through the middle, which means we're getting more power through the center. But look at the amount of peripheral damage around the outside. It's less. So we seem to be getting more power through the middle of a lens when we use it the wrong way round. Tough for you guys that have a diode laser. You can't swap your lens over and play with it. You're stuck with one way only. But for those people with a CO2 laser, look, we have got much more power concentrated in a much smaller area. So the lens manufacturers are basically telling us big porky pies. Nothing about it seems to be true. Welcome to my CO2 machine. This has got a round spot on it. Whereas your diode machines, it may be square, it may be rectangular, it may even be oval. The energy, once it's focused, is the same, whether it comes from a CO2 machine or from a diode laser machine. The, the wavelength is different and the way in which it affects the material is slightly different. But I'm going to show you the CO2 machine because it's much easier to demonstrate the problems that occur with a CO2 machine. But the same problems occur with an RF CO2 laser, which I've got one over there, which is at 30 watts, very similar to the diode machines that you might have at 20 watts. Both the RF machine and the diode laser machine are driven by an intermittent pulsing system, whereas this one is a constant power. And it's much easier to see the problems that I want to demonstrate with this machine. 
but they're the same problems at a different magnitude on these other PWM machines. Right, well, here we've got a lovely piece of Baltic birch plywood. It's quite light, um, it's a creamy colour. To keep the speed similar to those that you're going to get on a diode machine, I've got this set to 100 millimetres a second, that's 6,000 millimetres a minute. <laughs> Five, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 25. We can just about, maybe if you've got super eyesight, you might be able to see a mark on there at 15%. So let's just examine the logic of what we've done here. So we've got nearly 70 watts here, but it's an unfocused beam. This is the raw beam. Something else that you may notice if you look carefully, we've got no color change, but we've got change of line thickness and deeper cut. Okay, so we're gonna run that same test again, but this time 3000 millimeters a minute, 50 millimeters a second. By slowing it down, we've got a slightly darker shade of brown. Still not black. There is no color change because we've changed the power. 95, 25. So I think beyond any shadow of doubt here, you can see that color is not a function of speed. Now I'm just going to measure the depth of that one, the depth of this one, 0.16 millimetres. And on this one, 0 0.06 into this material. We've got what I call 3D-ness. Okay, so now what we've got in there is a two and a half inch focal length lens. But what we're going to do, we're going to run this at the same speed that we did previously, which is 50 millimetres a second. Now, I'm using exactly the same program that I used a few seconds ago. I've just squashed it down. It's running between 15 and 95% power. <laughs> I put this test piece over the top of our previous test piece because they are both running at between 15 and 95% power. This one is the raw beam and this one has been passed through a two and a half inch lens to concentrate it. It's the same beam running at the same speed with the same amount of power in the profiles. It starts off at 15%, 25 and goes up to 95%. Now, apart from the fact that we can see a significant difference in the line width at low power, and you'll notice that the line width does subtly get wider as the power increases. It's much more difficult to see it when it's passed through a lens, but it is there. But as the lines get thicker, they're not changing the blackness, they're all exactly the same colour black. Why would that be when we're increasing the power? So why is this dark brown? And why are these black? Now, let's just have a look at the edge if I can. They are cuts. Even at 15% with that thin line, look how deep we've managed to cut the very first line. I'm now going to change the speed. At the moment, it's about somewhere just over halfway. So if I reduce the speed, because I can't change the power, I've already got the power in this pattern set up to 100% at the top here nearly. Now that one was 50 millimeters a second, and this one was 30 millimeters a second. The lines here are slightly thicker, but I wouldn't know that till I looked at them under the microscope and measured them exactly. We've seen the change of line thickness with power. There is also going to be a thickness line change with speed as well, but it's more subtle. The question really I'm gonna ask you now is, what's the difference in color between those two samples? They're all, roughly black, as opposed to brown when we had no lens in. Are your eyes deceiving you? Are they really black? Let's just have a look. It's very definitely black. Or is it? Let's take the next one off. It's not black, but I can make it black by doing that. It's an optical illusion. If you can't get light into somewhere, you can't reflect the true color of what's inside. Your eyes are deceiving you. These black lines are not black at all. 
It's occlusion of light that appears to make them black. Your eyes and light are very funny things. They will play all sorts of tricks on you as I've just demonstrated. Okay, now I'm not going to change anything about this test except I'm going to close the line spacing up. Okay, now we've got a change of gap there. The white part between the cuts is different on the right to what it is on the left. On the left we've got two thin lines and that means we get more white between the lines. As the lines get darker and thicker, the gap closes down. Let me close it down just a little bit more. And what do we see? We're all of a sudden starting to see some colour coming into this. I, look, I changed nothing on that pattern except the spacing between the lines. They're both exactly the same pattern. Let me close it down just a little bit more. And look, all of a sudden we appear to be seeing black. But we know we're not seeing black because we've got the same power, we've got the same lines that we had here, remember, that were not black. <laughs> All we've done is change the spacing of the lines. But you'll notice on the left hand side we still have some light brown because the spacing between these lines is different to the spacing between these lines because remember as the power increases so the line thickness increases. We'll go down one more step and look we've produced black! Wow! Isn't that amazing? Hmm. You ought to look at it from the other direction. We've gone in there and we've produced a series of very very deep cuts. Now bear in mind these are not all the same power as you would normally do. This is a special program where I've got varying power. But as the power increases, the line width opens up. And because the line width is opening up, what we're finding is, at this last part of the cut, we are actually cutting below the surface. Whereas previously, they're all the same height. And it's not quite interfering with the next cut. But as soon as we start overlapping, the depth starts appearing and we start making a deeper cut. Right, now I'm going to use that same two and a half inch lens and I'm going to run a matrix test. Okay, so you look at my patterns from the side here and there's no difference in the colour between this one, this one, this one. And I know this one looks different because it's got some stripes in it. Um, I'm not going to discuss what those stripes are, but look, even these, they're slightly darker, but not a lot darker. But hang on, you'll notice that they've got some depth to these. And this has got depth and this is even deeper. And now all of a sudden we start getting depth into these. And this is a nice depth, that one, and clean. Now these here have gone really, really deep along with these. And they're dark. But hang on, part of that darkness is because we've got all this brown crud here. And that brown crud, if we hold it in the light, has actually painted the surface of these. These aren't actually brown. They look darker. But when you look down at the bottom, you'll see that they're covered in this in this light tarry crud that comes out of the cut that's produced by the cut. So the colour, again, is not what you think. And the other thing is, remember what you saw about the deep cuts. Let me just do this. Look. 
these are not what you think. I'm actually able to scrape these off. I couldn't scrape colour off. What we're doing is we're breaking those little combs off. Right? There's depth to those. There are little micro cuts in there which have got depth to them and I'm actually breaking them, breaking the comb teeth. So everything about this test is wrong. <laughs> You're being misled. It's messy. You misunderstand what the test is about, or certainly the people that designed these tests misunderstood what the whole purpose of them was. There is some value to them, and that is if you defocus very slightly, you can get this depth without the, um, without the comb. And that's very useful for people that are doing things like maybe a marquetry. You know, you want a certain uniform depth. Well, here's a way of getting a nice depth. Especially if you defocus very slightly, you don't get the comb effect. Okay, now I'm going to do another very simple test block this time. Um, and I've, let me show you what I've done. That was a line spacing of 0.5. This is a line spacing of 0.4. Point three, point two, and now point one. Now, most of you guys with a diode laser are using something like about point zero eight, which is even less than what I've got here. I've really changed the colour. What I have done has changed the depth. Right, now I could change the power and we could burn ourselves out of existence. But at the moment I've got this set on 60% power and we're running this at 200 millimeters a second. And as you can clearly see, you can see the 0.5 line spacing, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. And at 0.3, we're starting to get depth, which means we're overlapping the lines, but we're not producing dark color. The only time we started to produce dark color, we're producing some resinous smoke which is not being able to get away easily because there's a lot of it. I'm going to drop the table down by four millimeters. So I've put it out of focus by four millimeters and we'll run the same tests again. See the smoke is being blown out the side now because there is nowhere for it to go to the right hand side. We're working off like the edge of a cliff and the smoke is blowing away from the edge of the cliff. in here if you look right up at this end here you'll probably see that there is very little difference in the color between here and any of these these are all just a nice light woody brown the only reason this has gone brown is because all this crap has been blown across it this is tar that's settled on the job you're painting your job brown you're not engraving it brown I can only show you these very simple tests the elements of what cutting and engraving is all about. The only thing a lens can do is cut. You can make a lens cut softer by defocusing it. You're trying to make the beam so soft that you scorch the surface as we did here rather than cut the surface. Even though your diode laser might not be very good at cutting, it still has a cutting lens on it and it will, it will go in by a small amount and produce these sorts of effects. You don't remove material unless you physically evaporate it. Now I'm not going to go into the technology of how light evaporates wood. There are some good uses for this matrix. We've got a nice clean cut here without any charring and we've got little or no comb effect in there. Alright, so this is pretty solid on the bottom here. We're getting a little bit of comb effect there and we shall have a lot of comb effect here. But it's not particularly deep, it's just a rippled surface, it's not a deep comb effect. We've got a little hint here of this brown effect because of the smoke damage, the tar damage, the tar that's being ejected from here. So this is 
on the edge of being okay. This is good. And this is what, half a millimetre deep? Well, if you want to do 3D engraving, and I've done that about, what, two and a half millimetres deep? So that means five cuts on there, five passes, should produce a nice 3D effect. Okay, I've now changed the lens to a one and a half inch Plano convex, and I'm going to run the same matrix test. Okay. smoke that was being produced there. This is a much sharper lens. Now we've just seen what an inch and a half lens can do. Look it produces a really really black tarry muck in the corner there where my thumb is. Let's just have a go with an alternative lens that I have created. More of an engraving lens it's certainly absolutely rubbish at cutting. absolutely rubbish cutting lens. I've had to slow it right down just to attempt to get that out of cut. It did just, just. There's the standard inch and a half engraving lens, probably two millimeters deep in there and very black and tarry. This one is about maybe a millimetre deep, maybe half a millimetre deep, so it's substantially shallower. It's black, but look at the tar around the outside. It's not there. This one, colour, a little teeny weeny bit of depth, but again about half the depth of this one. These virtually no different. And when we look at the other end, well, This is my engraving lens, and this is the cutting lens. Engraving, virtually no depth in that at all. Mainly just colour. As you can see, there is a pleasing range of colour on there without crap. As opposed to this one, which, well, if you ever wanted to do grayscale engraving, that one would probably be a lot better at grayscale engraving so, what's special about this lens? Now, there's no trickery here. I'm going to take this lens out and I'm going to show you exactly what this lens is. Cutting takes place right down the centre of the lens. Remember those red rays that pass right through the centre of the lens? I've taken them away. I've stopped them doing their cutting job. And what I've got around the outside is the bit that does the engraving. Now, you may not believe that, but hey, the evidence is in front of your eyes. I'm just trying to give you some facts. I understand a lot about lenses. I've spent a great deal of time, as you can see, investigating lenses and how they work. Okay, now I've swapped the lens again, because hey, one of the things that this thing is good at is telling us the difference between the performance of lenses. So I've now got a compound lens in there which has got a very short focal length of around about 21 millimeters and it's specifically designed for photo engraving producing very very small crisp dots. We'll test it on this grayscale map. You can see from the precision of the letters 
that it's a very, very fine lens. And it's also cutting through this wood here at uh, 35 millimeters a second. So here we are, here's my non-cutting lens. And here's the very sharp lens. So we've got a bit more color up here, but there's not much depth there. None there. Darker here, really black. Not there. Depth, not, oh, look what's happened. <laughs> yeah, you see what I mean? It's produced all those little combs in there. And this one must be the same. Yep. So, colour is not what it seems. That's little more than soot, really. Now, people are using these machines to do what they think is grayscale engraving. It's not really grayscale photo engraving at all. It's a strange hybrid mix of taking a photo and making the dark bits deeper than the light bits. Yeah, okay, they're darker, but as you've seen how fragile dark can be. You've only got to scratch it and rub it and it may well flake off. In effect, what they're doing is 3D engraving with a non-special bitmap. You need a special bitmap to do proper 3D engraving like this. And so you'll have to go and look on the old interweb. If you go and look up 3D bitmaps or 3D CNC bitmaps, just Google something like that. You'll find all these sort of, they look strange waxy looking images, black and white. Wax is about the best way that I can describe it. As soon as you see one, you'll know what I mean. It's a bit like a topographical map. We've got different layers in here, which have got different colors. And those are really proper 3D engraving bitmaps. A photo image is not a 3D engraving bitmap, and it would just get basically rubbish out of it. So the claim is that this will also do different materials. In other words, you can grayscale on slate. Now, I've got myself a little piece of slate here. It's not particularly flat, but it'll do the job that I want it to do. We'll use this uh, compound engraving lens again. gray and gray. Okay we've got some different textures here and we've got a little bit of depth but the thing is this material is basically sand. Gray sand that's been compressed into slate. The thing that happens to sand when you melt it is it turns to glass and we'll take a look at that under the microscope and you'll see that again your eye is being fooled. There are all sorts of different color grays on there but this grey here, for example, it's like a, a glass honeycomb. It gives a completely different colour to the eye. I mean, when you scratch this mechanically, what colour do I get? Grey. This is what I call a binary material. You've got slate, grey, and glass grey. That's it. Just two colours. No matter how much you play with the power, you cannot get more than two colours. This is a binary material. Now there are many other binary materials around which are not suitable for grayscale engraving. Here's one of them, acrylic. Yeah, you can mark the acrylic with different shades of white slightly, right? But it still basically only produces white. The white comes about because of a trick of the light. Again, this funny thing with light and your eyes. That's a bit like a cat's eye in the road. It's reflecting and refracting the light in different directions to produce the appearance of white. There's no chemical change to that surface. It's just been melted into little patterns which produce the appearance of white light. This is anodized aluminium. 
This black surface on here is basically a water-based dye. Any colour anodizing that you pick up is a water-based dye and whatever you do to it, it will always turn white underneath. Look, here it is. And what we're seeing there is white aluminium oxide, which is the base material that's underneath the dye. And what you're really doing is you're just evaporating the dye away from the white aluminium oxide. This is a binary colour. You can't get. Let's do it. Let's do it. Now the aluminium oxide has got a very, very high melting point, around about something over 2000 degrees C, whereas the dye evaporates at something like about 150 to 200 degrees C. So there's a huge difference between the energy required to evaporate the dye and the energy required to actually burn right through the aluminium oxide to the bare aluminium that's underneath. Yeah, it looks as though we've got some slight shading there on those first two. I don't think you have. If I look at that carefully, there's not quite enough energy to take all the dye out of the surface there. But where it has taken it out, it's white. But of course, the white has mixed in with the black background, which gives it the impression of being grey. Again, another trick between light and your eyes. So this is another binary material. What use is that? I mean, you'd certainly never be able to engrave a photograph on there, could you? I mean, anodized aluminium, photographs, not possible. How's that happened? That was done on this machine, but it wasn't done with grayscale engraving. So the one thing that your machine will be good at is not grayscale engraving but it will be able to deal with dithered engraving if you understand how to do dithered engraving. See, look, dithered engraving is suitable for binary materials as well as wood. Please, please stop worrying about these things and learn how to do dithered photo engraving. Now, there's a wonderful piece of software out there called ImageR, which, to be honest, it isn't my method exactly, but it's getting close if you buy the professional version of it and use this sort of lens. You won't be able to use this sort of lens, a compound lens, if you have got a diode laser. You may think that you've got a very, very small spot, but all I'll ask you to do is what I'm going to do here. Put a pulse you'll say, ah, oh, that's a very fine, small pulse. Move it. Let's hold the pulse on for a few seconds. One, two. Can you see the difference in the size of those dots? That's the point that I mentioned to you earlier. There is no such thing as a focal point. Certainly on wood, we'll do a pulse. And then we'll move it and we'll do another longer pulse. What do you think about a focal point now? Now the point is, many of the people that use these have got no idea what their machine is really capable of. You must go outside these standard, very easy to use tools, which is demonstrated to you today. It's not a very useful tool at all. Spend your time learning about your machine. Find out what size dot you can produce on your machines. Find out what size line thickness, because I've shown you that the line thickness changes with power and with speed. You can't use a fixed line interval for doing a test like this. Technically, every one of these should have its own line interval. Now, before I finish this session off, there's one more material that people love to use. This is HDF or MDF. This is HDF, which has got a higher mm, plastic content than MDF. But the point is, basically wood dust bonded together with something that's akin to a Bakelite material. It's not Bakelite, but it's a solid, hard setting plastic material, which is used as a binder. Is this a binary material? Is this a material with a range of colors? It's, it's a nice material to cut and engrave. Well, 
you could say that that's got a quite a nice colour range on it. And to be honest, apart from that last one, which was producing a lot of crap here. Ah, ah, ah. Damn, look at that. The colours are about as fragile as the wind. What more can I say? I'm afraid there's a lot more to laser cutting and engraving than just pressing a few buttons in a piece of software. You must understand the other side of the problem, which is where the rubber hits the road where the laser beam hits your material. Well, we're going to use my microscope now to do what I promised, which is to examine the surface finish of some of the samples that we've been dealing with. Now, one of the interesting things I want you to look at is that very intense light. It doesn't look very intense to you because the camera tends to blow it out, but it's a beam of light that's coaxial with the microscope. It comes through the lens and it's actually focused down to a spot that's maybe only two, maybe two and a half millimetres diameter. It's a very, very intense light. And you'll notice what it's doing at the moment. I'm shining that light onto those black characters. Now, remember what black is? It's an optical delusion. And what I'm doing now is shining the light right down into that black character. I'm going to take this in and out of focus very slightly and you'll see that I'm on the surface of the wood. Can you see that? I'm now going to raise the table and we're going to travel down inside one of those numbers. And if you take a look here, you'll see that we've got basically clean wood as I travel all the way down the inside. I mean, the depth of field on this focus is very, very small, but we can get down and down and down and we get to almost the bottom of the slot now and things go out of focus because I just can't see the bottom of the slot. And that's what we were looking at. So there's the plain Baltic birch down here and here we've got a little bit of colour into it, but most of the colour, as you see, is coming from the grain structure. Now this whiter stuff is probably the cellulose because it has got basically a very high water content and it evaporates easily and stays white because you can't scorch water. But the cell walls that contain the cellulose are made up of a strange material called lignin. And lignin is a very complex chemical. And this is the stuff that I think that gives off these horrible smoky fumes. So let's move across to 200 millimeters a second. And now we've got a bit more color coming in. But again, you can see the scan lines here very clearly, the horizontal scan lines, but they're not producing the colour. The colour is being produced by this secondary effect. So it requires a lot more temperature to destroy the lignin than it does to evaporate basically the cellulose, which is, as I said, mainly water. Let's jump straight down to 100 millimetres a second and we've put the power up now to 30%. What's going on there? So now we've definitely got the scan lines that you can see, and we're doing damage with the scan lines in a rather strange pattern, which at the moment I'm not going to even talk about, but what we're getting is, again, variation here because of different burning properties of different parts of the material. Some parts of the material are producing this, well, it's not, it's not carbon, it's not scorching. If you look very closely, you see that it's little, got little bright white lights on it. It's almost like resinous material that's coming out of the wood. So let's move down to the most burnt. We can see the scan lines and we can see all these little bright spots in here, which undoubtedly are reflections off of something which probably is, as I said, it looks like a resinous material. Let's just zoom in a little bit. Look at all those highlights, that crystal structure. So this colour that we're seeing is some complex chemical which is not carbon, but it is a sort of a like a burnt resin of some sort. And the next one looks lighter because it's a mixture of less dark and more natural wood. And again, we can see the pattern here. We can see the grain structure of the wood, which is being affected in different ways. That's the fascinating structure of wood. Now here we're looking at a piece of red acrylic. And as I mentioned to you before, this is a binary material. 
Well, it's not exactly a binary material because if you put too much heat into it, it will be red. Okay, so I'm now on the surface of the material. And what we see here, look, looks like bubbles. Yeah. Now, if I drop down into the groove that I've produced, I raise the table up, bring it into focus, deeper into, and look at all those bubbles in the bottom. Now, I've only moved it up maybe two or three microns. And all of a sudden, in the bottom of our acrylic, we've got all these bubbles. Now, these bubbles are acting just like cat's eyes. They're, they're dispersing the light in all directions and creating this visual effect of white. Now, what happens is the acrylic boils at about 160 degrees C. And there it is, it's boiling. If you take it to 200 degrees C, it evaporates and you don't get any bubbles. You just get red acrylic in the bottom of your groove. So there's a very careful balance of energy input that you need to create this bubbling effect without destroying or evaporating the acrylic. It can be a binary material if you get the balance of energy right. OK, let's go on and have a look at our slate. The fact that we can see little highlights in here tells us this is not naked slate, scratched slate. This is something else. And if I zoom in with a higher magnification, so as you can see, as I zoom in and out, we've got like a honeycomb structure of bubbles inside bubbles. And the light is reflected everywhere. So these are definitely pieces of glass that have formed on the surface. These are not stone chips. This is glass that's been formed by heating. Let's move down to 30% and see what effect the heat has had. We've got slightly smaller bubbles, but they're still glass. Look at the way in which the light changes as I bring it in and out of focus. The reflection tells you that these are glass bubbles. And then we drop down to the lowest power, very, very small bubbles now. So the bubble size depends on the amount of power that you're putting into it. That is the optical illusion that creates a vague impression of colour difference. Now there's that finely textured bubble surface of 100 millimetres a second, 15%, where you can clearly see some lines, some scan lines. Then we go up to 400 millimetres a second, where again, now we're running very fast. The scan lines have dropped right down in size and got thinner. So we're seeing more of the background through the scan lines, which gives the impression of maybe a gray because we've got a mixture of white and black, which your eyes see. And just to finish with, here's my special lens that is just an engraving lens. It's not a cutting lens, as I demonstrated to you. It's got a completely different pattern of power hitting the surface. It's a much gentler pattern and look, how it's picked out preferentially these parts of the grain structure that it doesn't want to burn and those parts of the grain structure where there's enough energy to actually erode the surface and go deeper into the grain structure. Now when I look at my special engraving lens under the microscope I'm moderately impressed with the results and so I've come back and I'm going to do a little bit more of a careful test on it because when I look at the results, there's quite a good colour range on 400 without doing too much damage to the surface. 300, well, there's a lot more damage to that than I would like. If I stay at 400 millimetres a second and start extending this power range down, there's a possibility I might get close to something that would approximate to grayscale engraving range. Obviously with grayscale, you can only use one power. So basically I'm using this chart here to establish which is the best color range. That looks like the best color range, but on the other hand, that is pretty 3D. That's about half a millimeter deep. This is about 0.1 or 0.2 deep only. And I wonder what's happening if I push this range right down to say 95%. with a very careful choice of parameters and a special lens which doesn't cut. The final conclusion is what we've been talking about all the way through this video, even with a very careful choice of parameters which we selected from this chart using my very special engraving lens, 
which is not something that you guys have, but even that has an effect here on the first two, maybe three colors. And then after that, they're all the same shade of brown. So we're not getting a proper grayscale engraving range from power change. Thanks for your time. And I hope it's been entertaining rather than boring. <laughs>